please be aware that there are major spoilers ahead. If you have not finished the game, please do. I don't want to ruin your experience of the game. Once upon a time. A god fell from heaven, stilling the Hebra winds. The heavens grew lifeless, just as the air below thinned. There was a magician who was sealed by a goddess. It seems as though this goddess was sealed too within this mysterious temple. The ebb and flow of these two powerful beings ripples through time, harkening back to an era of antiquity. Settle down, tuck in, and dream of a land called Hyrule. I can no longer sense the presence of the Mother Goddess statue which dwells in the vast canyon. This place invites speculation. It begs for it. I had plans as soon as I booted up Tears of the Kingdom. I was going to ride a platform over with a Korok leaf all the way to the Forgotten Temple. Sadly, I only got so far. Plan B. Avoid Lookout Landing and go straight for the Forgotten Temple. I forgot I had to descend a giant cliff with no paraglider. It's Princess Zelda, she's safe. I bet that's not Princess Zelda. So I learned my lesson and I finally grabbed the paraglider and straight to Tanagar Canyon I went. Every moment was filled with anticipation for what could happen next. For some context, I looked at art book leaks almost right away and assembled a very large, very clean map for all the spoiler channels on various Zelda discords. So when I uncovered this place, I felt like I hit the jackpot. The Orleans historian jumped in a VC with me, Wiz Catches Lightning, and Banoon. He said that we should all really go to the Great Plateau and do a quest there. In fact, he insisted on it. At this point, I was obsessively exploring the depths looking for any indication of Linnae Remining Facility. Lo Rulian coaxed me in when he said, part of the quest is done in the depths. So, if you go to the Great Plateau where the front gate is, and you blow it open with a bomb, the water drains, revealing the original entrance. Under the water is this little fella. You might recognize him from Lookout Landing. If you haven't done this quest, I recommend pausing the video and doing it now. The entrance is drained and Link speaks to an oddly shaped deity. You who hear my voice, come to me in the Temple of Time Ruins, up the road on the plateau to the south. The goddess statue in the Temple of Time, she isn't quite herself. You who hear my voice, as a result of you draining the water from the gate, a part of me has been freed. You have earned my gratitude. In Japanese, this reads a little differently. Because you drained the water from the castle gate, a part of me has been released. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. To quote Lorelian directly here, Anyone who says the plateau wasn't a castle must be reeling right now. Not only was it the original seat of Raru and Sonia's Nascent, but the actual gate leading up to the plateau is a castle gate. So let's continue with the translations instead, shall we? I am far below this land, talking to you by borrowing the form of this statue. The fact that whoever is speaking to Link can borrow the goddess Hylia's statue is, well, unsettling to say the least. How are we supposed to take this? It's bizarre. And then a quest comes up. A call from the depths. To the one who hears my voice, I shall guide you to four chasms on this plateau. This group of kanji means abysmal pit, chasm. Mm. Around each of these should be my eyes, 
drop these into the chasms. I was shown the locations of four chasms. Deliver them to me. And told to throw the four eyes into the chasms. To the land beneath this temple. And carry them to the place beneath the temple of time. Do this for me, and I shall give you a reward. So the reason Lilian wanted me to look into this so badly is that the statue is effectively taking over the goddess statue, which is, well, strange. Then I wander over to find one of these eyes, and I gotta say, they kind of remind me of Sheikatek, but the thing that reminded me most about these eyes was the ceiling from the ice cavern in Ocarina of Time. Meanwhile, I'm racking my brain trying to remember if there are any four-eyed deities in the series. Once Link places all four of these eyes, the statue speaks. Thank you for returning to me, my four eyes, the vessels of my spirit. Thanks to you, we can now speak. As promised, I will repay your kindness by bestowing good fortune upon you. Then, the deity gives Link the choice between a stamina vessel and a heart container. The quest is now complete. By throwing the four eyes nearby into the four chasms and carrying all the eyes to the voice, I was able to speak to the sealed stone statue. You, who revived my spirit's four eyes, offer me. Offer pose to me. Spirits that ought to return to the afterlife. They're pitiful beings who have lost their way home and wander this land. I'm the one who returns all pose to the afterlife without prejudice. Good. Evil, that's the futile perspective of narrow-minded beings. There's no such distinction in wandering spirits. So, in my last theory about the Forgotten Temple, linked in the description, there were many conclusions that it came to. One, the Forgotten Temple was buried. Two, the Mother Goddess statue was moved to the Forgotten Temple from the sealed grounds. This would have taken place around the era of chaos, before the Temple of Time was constructed. 3. The presence of updrafts suggested that there were large caves below this place which, well, do I even need to say it? 4. The Guardians were placed there to protect the facility, and I refuse to believe that they would be placed there to protect some comfy pants that Link receives after finishing all the shrines. 5. If the Forgotten Temple was the old Temple of Time, it would have been connected to Lineru Mining Facility. And 6. Mommy Hylia in the Forgotten Temple with the Goddess Sword. Let's explore each of these ideas. The Forgotten Temple was buried. The Forgotten Temple has structural support to hold an immense amount of weight. Everything from the corbels acting as structural pillars to the string courses supports this argument. The mommy statue was moved here later, but I asserted that this place would have been built during or right after the Sky Era. This is neither confirmed nor denied, but it gets clear from the memories that it has essentially existed since the founding of Pyrrhal. Heaps of large amounts of dirt lay on both sides of the canyon with little to no foliage. The canyon extends all the way from Garuda Highlands to Tabantha Tundra. It stops at the Forgotten Temple. The canyon was tied so closely to the royal family during development that was called Valley of the Royal Family. My argument for this entire structure being under the earth was based on page 366 of Creating a Champion. These excavations King Rome ordered to uncover the ancient relics, looking for anything that would help in the upcoming calamity. Hindsight being 2020, I'd put my money on the royal family looking for the secret stones. There's a hole in the back of this room that was likely blown open later when this place was excavated. 
the hole was blown open when they realized that the temple clearly extended. It is actually not there in the cutscenes in the past. If whoever uncovered this place would have gotten one layer further, they would have reached the secret stones. Or at least the chamber, depending on how you see the timeline. Raru, Zelda, and the sages go to the Forgotten Temple after Sonia is killed, and Ganondorf becomes the Demon King, using Sonia's secret stone. There are boxes and crates and many soldiers just kind of hanging out around the temple doors. They are, presumably, hiding from the Demon King. It makes sense that this would take place in an underground secret bunker. Raru and Zelda did just kind of beam out of there. Which, who knew the Puripad could take multiple people with them? Going to some secret underground bunker would be optimal. However, to take one from Draken's book, no confirm, no deny. So the next part of my theory was that the goddess statue had to have moved to the Ferran Temple. The goddess statue has rubble behind and around it, which I felt like was indicative of the goddess statue moving. Lucky for me, I was right. This is verifiable merely based on the vast distance between the Mother Goddess statue and the Skyview Spring, which is later named a Spring of Power. But the Mother Goddess statue is not present in these or any other cutscenes that take place here. So it was moved, but this begs the question, where was it moved from? And I also happen to be right about the Temple of Time moving because there is literally a piece of the Temple of Time that moved to the sky. The back of the chamber was gone which was moved to the sky. And instead of obtaining the Master Sword, the story pulls a 180 and sends the Master Sword back instead. However, that part of the Temple of Time is still present in the ground. This also appears to be the same place that the Temple of Time in the sky was originally placed. This implies that the sealed grounds is likely the Great Plateau, the birthplace of Hyrule. This was not always a plateau though. It was once a castle. One of the things I found interesting is a detail that we may have all conveniently forgotten from Ocarina of Time. The walls of Castletown somewhat resemble the walls of the Great Plateau. All over the Great Plateau, there are these arches and walls, which all look to be way older than other structures found in Hyrule made by these Hylians. Not the Zonai, because they were godlike engineers and builders. No, these are kind of like Mod Podge together and look incredibly primitive. So while journeying deep into the history of Japan, I learned a few things. One of the things I learned from an awesome YouTube channel called Lymphamy, which will be linked in the description below, was that Shinto and Buddhism did not always go hand in hand. In fact, there was once a time that Buddhism was looked at as negatively by the imperial royal family. Emperor Kanmu moved the capital from Nara to Hai and Kyo, partly to escape the powerful clutches of Buddhist temples around the capital. And what happens to be at the Great Plateau? Well, there's the bargainer that seems to be in the entrance of the Great Plateau and directly below it. Good. Evil. That's the futile perspective of narrow-minded beings. There is no such distinction in wandering spirits is also a very Buddhist message. See, when there was a problem with an evil spirit, usually a Buddhist monk was called to help guide the soul to the afterlife. That is, once Buddhism was legal. Understanding some of Japan's history helps us see the frame in which the Japanese view the world and base their legends from. You see, the imperial family's claim relied on one specific document, the Nihon Shoki, which claimed the imperial family had lineage from Amaterasu the sun goddess. So the bargainer may pose some threat to Hylia's power and her plan to continuously reincarnate. I'm still exploring and trying to understand the history about how Buddhism was and still is viewed. I plan to circle back around to all these ideas in a follow-up episode whenever I understand it better. Anyway. 
The guardians were placed in the Forgotten Temple to protect something more important than Link's comfy pants. Turns out, the guardians were placed here to protect the secret stones. That seems like a pretty good reason to have them here. Then the matter comes down to when the guardians were placed there and why. And I'm not sure of either of those things. If the Forgotten Temple was the old Temple of Time, then Linnaeus Mining Facility would be right next to it. The short answer is I was wrong. Lanayru Refinery is on the other side of the map. The Construct Factory is in Faron, but let's consider this from another angle, shall we? Long, long ago, and longer than that, a god fell from the heavens, and the winds of Hebra ceased. With the winds ceased, the heavens stagnated, and with the heavens stagnated, the land fell into ruin. We were fighting against a natural disaster. The gods seemed to observe the sky hopelessly, and everyone rallied together to help them. Mysterious ships that float in the sky. We will build it, launch it, and float it into the sky. The god was returned to the sky, and in thanks they gifted us this great ship. The winds were restored, and both heaven and earth were appeased. Everything from the color to the design of the ship reminds me of the sand ship and the shipyard from Skyward Sword. These huge blocks that litter Hebra look like different pieces of the shipyard with these cute little eyes and the triangle patterned bands that wrap these squares. Consider the shipyard may have been moved to the sky. This could have been how large amounts of zonite were moved between the ground and the sky because not everyone has a magical Sheikah Slate to store items within. I'm sure this point can be refuted many ways, but the one detail that is undeniable is that both the shipyard and the sand ship have to do with ships. Imagine. Which is what is absolutely dominating the Hebrew sky in Tears of the Kingdom. The ocean did supposedly exist due to the presence of rock salt being found almost everywhere throughout Hyrule, and Link's boomerang from the Wind Waker is found within the Heber mine. This could mean that all the northern part of Hyrule's map was at one time an ocean. If not, the idea of the shipyard being floated to the sky is not as drastic as it may seem. This region already had ancient technology littered through it. Over time, it may have drifted from Lanayru to Hebra. However, the ancient Stormark disagrees with this assessment. No, the Rito built these ships and floated them to the sky. Where would the Rito get the designs and schematics for ships like this? They were supposedly helping a god. The god they referred to is Kamisama, which means one god. So it's difficult to distinguish what is meant by Kamisama. This may be the result of a single zonai falling from the sky. Just one little guy falls off a sky platform. Another problem with the term Kamisama is that it may have been passed down over centuries by word of mouth because, like Drake and Wiles so brilliantly points out in her analysis of the Rito, they have very little written records and an elder to memorize all the old tales passed down by the Rito. Signs do point to some kind of alliance with the Zonai because, well, there are Zonai parts within the storm arc. I'll leave it up to you to decide what fits your headcanon. And I look forward to reading your thoughts on this below. Okay. And last, Mommy Hylia in the Forgotten Temple with the Goddess Sword. And I was right. This is the theory I'm the most proud of. When I was making the theory about the Forgotten Temple, Charlie really didn't love the theory and suggested cutting it. I stuck to my guns because the idea about the Goddess Sword was what forced me to examine the Forgotten Temple in the first place. I asserted that it would be possible to obtain the Goddess Sword from the Mother Goddess statue, 
And if Link goes to the springs and offers the claws from Farosh, Dinral, and Nehru, and returns to the Forgotten Temple, the Mother God statue is restored. In addition, she will bestow upon Link the White Sword of the Sky, or the Heavenly White Blade Sword, or in other words, the Goddess White Sword. The same sword Link is given at the beginning of his adventures in Skyward Sword. This is significant because it makes my dumb mean that I posted about the video correct. She has a stash of them. I'm not even kidding, if Link breaks the goddess sword, he can simply go back and request another one from the goddess statue. I know, I'm a genius. Okay, so what about all the new stuff? All the way in the back of this temple is the map room. This marks all the locations where the memories can be found. I can't help but wonder what else this room might have been used for. Assuming the room was here during the events that took place in the past, it must have been used for something. Most of the map is made out of stone representing the land, and sand is representing the water. The castle doesn't look like it was made at the same time as the rest of the map. It looks like it is made of copper. These tiles on top mark the locations of the geoglyphs found throughout Hyrule, which came from Zelda's dragon form. Each of these tiles was likely placed here after the events of the past. There are areas that appear to be on water on this map, and are not water in Hyrule. Namely, this tear shape from around Lookout Landing extending down throughout Hyrule Field. The River of the Dead appears to have been land. and the water actually extended around the Colosseum and into the Dig Dog Suspension Bridge area. The Dueling Peaks appears to have been one mountain, and Tanagar Canyon appears to have the same level as Gerudo Desert on the map. This appears to be the Zonai War Room. The Sky People have these two competing characteristics, being peaceful engineers and being warlike. Clearly, they made weapons in the past since the forge is present in the sky. All the weapons and the armor couldn't have only been made for Link. There must have been other reasons. One of the things that fascinates me is the barbarian armor from Breath of the Wild and it's also available in Tears of the Kingdom. The armor describes the people who favored this armor as warlike, but all things considered, this appears to be something of a replica to me at least. Imagine you were a caveman living in the ancient past. Then you saw these futuristic people climbing out of holes and flying into the sky. Wouldn't you try to be like them? Everything the Zonai have is made out of copper and Zonite, so it would be fair to conclude that the armor does not belong to Zonai. Perhaps this may be Bokoblin armor, or maybe it was some kind of second scion race that adopted all the Zonai techniques and culture and appreciated the culture so much that they kind of borrowed it. They just moved in and filled this place up. Slapped some mud over the top and call it their own. But let's look at the other side of this equation. Parts of the architecture are breaking off, revealing the underlying architecture that looks like something other than Zonai architecture found in the sky above and the depths below. I'm not entirely sure what to make of the barbarian armor. Looking at the barbarian armor aesthetic against the vast majority of Zonai ruins on the surface and the sky makes you wonder, is the smooth marble stone underneath like every single one? Or just the things around Tabia's hollow? Maybe it was a way of the Zonai making themselves hide their magical properties and make the people think that they were more primitive than they are better to hide their secrets and the stones. If you are looking for an advanced race and you find these ruins, your first thought wouldn't be lasers, robots, fans, flying objects. You would think wall, face painting, stonework, torches, and crazy rituals. 
So someone finding these primitive ruins in search of the secret stones instead of the original ruins would stop right there and not search much further. They were looking for an advanced group of people and not a primitive tribe after all. Though armor's war paint seems to be the magical ingredient here. That was left to make the finders think that painting themselves was their magic and that this is nothing special and not worth further investigations. The armor is described as a traditional armor that bolsters the fighting spirit, drawing out the wearer's inner animal. The peoples who favored this armor were an ancient warlike tribe, further separating them from magic. But with the introduction of yet another mysterious race that lives in the depths, it definitely presents more questions than answers. The last thing I'd like to address is the door sealing this room. On the door is this very peculiar symbol. For some reason, it looked very familiar, and I didn't know why. A preliminary Google search didn't reveal anything, so I moved on. YouTube recommended a video about the Spherot. The Spherot is known generally in the West as the Tree of Life, and is a map of consciousness used in Kabbalistic Judaism. This is viewed by some as the structure of a spiritual vessel and the structure of reality itself. While this does belong to what could be considered the more mystical side of Judaism, it is considered to be very sacred by many people. This depiction used in the Temple of Time and within the Forgotten Temple does call into question whether or not Nintendo is, once again, guilty of cultural appropriation. According to IMDb, the chanting in the Fire Temple in the original version of the game was a Muslim chant in Arabic that translates to, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And this was removed because Nintendo did not want to offend Muslims who are quite familiar with the chant. So there is a question here. Is this cultural appropriation? There are cultures that encourage and enjoy sharing their culture. For instance, wearing kimono is something that is totally kosher with the Japanese community. I'm not really in the position to determine this myself, but I do live within a traditional Jewish community. I intend to investigate the subject by asking many different people if this is cultural appropriation and presenting the results to you. Returning to my first question, it is difficult to determine the culprit behind the toppling of the goddess statue. Perhaps it was the demon king with this newfound power. He went there and uprooted the statue. There are a few problems with this line of thought though. When Ganondorf falls from the platform, the chamber Link faces him in is relatively close by. The second issue is that no gloom is present within the temple. There is not a chasm below the statue, so it was probably not Ganondorf. Something tells me that it's mystical. Considering the bargainer was able to speak through the statue to Link, it would be fair to consider him a suspect. So let's talk about the place that Link meets the bargainer. The Great Abandoned Central Mine. Like I said earlier, the depths is my territory. All the homies in Discord were harping on me. Mox, you need hearts. Mox, you need to do shrines or you're going to get one shot. I am an Elden Lord. I don't need hearts. I am the king of the depths. The first Gleok I killed was King Gleok. I have the credentials to prove it. Don't at me about needing hearts. I merged covered in dirt with four hearts. All the homies in VC were ragging on me until I had enough crystal charges for an entire four energy cells. Then no one was laughing. Just because people were telling me it was impossible to explore the entire underground with four hearts, it made me want to do it just that much more. It forced me to get creative with my traversal and efficient because I was still only working with one stamina wheel. I continued finding all these tiny mining facilities. Wiz was convinced that he had found every single last one because it was part of a quest. Which, well, it wasn't. Not every single one. 
There are so many in almost every region. Not just the major refineries with various statues leading to them. Finding all of them three days into playing would be nearly impossible. I knew because I was grinding and locking the whole map. I think I almost have this thing figured out. So I was wrong about the mining facility only being underneath the Forgotten Temple. The operations extended across the whole map. The small mining facilities broke down the zone into smaller, easy to transport pieces. For instance, the fan item description reads, a zonai device that produces wind with its internal propeller. It's likely that the zonai made smart use of wind power to transport objects and generate thrust. The zonai, or these lizard people, or the constructs would transport them to the refineries using these way stations if parts broke down on their vehicles. The statues acted as a guide for those to find their way in the dark. This is supported by the footpaths, similar to the horse trails in Hyrule above, absent of any foliage. In addition, the presence of Poe's along these footpaths solidifies this statement. Upon entering the facility, Link is greeted by a stored construct. Welcome. This was once a busy refinery where a great deal of zonite was processed. It is all but abandoned now. I do still have associates here who process ore and manage schema stones. You should speak with them. The schema stones are an example of how zonite would be transported. According to the stored construct found at the various refineries, schema stones can automatically produce the assembled product they depict. Autobuild can produce the products that you have previously assembled. This previous assembly is not required if you have a schema stone. My associates have more schema stones. I recommend taking the time to visit other abandoned mines. Can we just talk about the fact that the constructs refer to each other as associates? It's so cute. Once the zonite made it to the refinery, the zonite is processed by the forge constructs. This is according to any of the forge constructs found at any of these various refineries. They are smelted down into easier to carry pieces to be transported by the authorized users. The flux constructs seen underground were likely to oversee that the authorized users were able to transport the zonite safely. I don't think that the constructs are capable of actually fixing the equipment. This may have also been the duty of the lizard folk. Perhaps the zonai would assign the blueprints sort of like the draftsmen. Speaking of which, the schema stones are referred to as blueprints in Japanese. Then, the draftsman would deliver the schema stone, detailing the layout of the facility. Then, perhaps, there were the zonai, a special type of construct, or the lizard folk to auto-build the facilities. Wiz suggested that they were the magma, which I'm kind of on board with. I think that it's a fair conclusion with the information available. Perhaps the lizard race were the miners. I speculate that these constructs were assigned to run operations. Let me know your ideas about this because I haven't seen every item or spoken to every NPC. Here's something that Benoon added. Several beddings from Nero's construct kind can be found in the spirit temple. We can assume that this was the place where the body parts from the depot were brought to in order to assemble them. On Dragonhead Island, we can also find those beddings. This might be the place where Minero has studied the constructs and where she had put in the finishing touches to them right before she transferred her spirit into the Pura Pad. So, perhaps she gave these plans to the sword or forge constructs to continue the operations. I think they may have been assembled at the construct factory and then transported as a unit inside of these beddings. They are capable of carrying out tasks, and the constructs have emotions and personality. I think it'd be fair to conclude that the constructs are sentient, and that they would have carried out their duties until they broke down. But let's keep following this trail of zonite. From here, the zonite, crystal charges, and the zonite charges were likely carted to the great abandoned central mine. I came to this conclusion for a few reasons. The zonite item description reads, an unusual material that has many purposes. 
Ancients extracted energy from it and refined it for the crafting of weapons and armor. Based on this, it'd be fair to conclude that it once made it to a singular facility. From here, it was shipped. It was transported to the Zonai Forge and the Construct Factory. The weapons, for the most part, seemed to be produced in the sky. I came to this conclusion after exploring nearly the entirety of the underground and a fair amount of the sky. The only place I found Zonai weapons available underground is the Spirit Temple. The Construct Factory was an exciting find. Yes, this is not the Lunaru mining facility, but this is the next version of it. This was meant for the operation to protect the skies and carrying out the various mining operations. The mining that began in Lunaru mining facility was specifically to carry out Hylia's plan, which was constructing both gates of time. They were for mining space time stones. Quote, space time stones are a critical source of energy for us as well as the machines that we use. It's why we're so hard at work, Zert. These were refined at Lene Remining Facility, which is constructed of ancient technology. Quote, I calculate the probability that this large-scale device is constructed from ancient technology at 85%. The way I've been thinking of this is it's kind of like Minecraft. Imagine all the surface level stuff is just small gems of energy useful, but not very potent. Next layers have space-time stones. If you remember from Skyward Sword, these stones were mined in relatively shallow caves. These caves were close to the surface, similar to the caves that appeared all over Hyrule during the upheaval. These were likely all stripped away and used for their extremely powerful properties. And then one of the greatest energy-producing stones is really only found in the depths. Quote, Yes, crystallized charges are material used in the creation of energy wells. They are made by processing zonite. Zonite can be excavated even in the mining cave on this island, though there is very little left here. It is unlikely that you will find enough to produce an energy well. Greater concentrations can be found in the distant depths of the world below. It was originally mined from there. So, to summarize here, the zonite was mined and broken down into smaller pieces to be transported to the refineries. These would be transported on foot using the skimmer stones. Once refined, it was transported to either the Great Central Mine, the Construct Factory, or the Zonite Forge to be crafted into constructs, armor, or weapons. I intend to thoroughly cover the constructs and the sky people in my next theory. There's a lot of translations to confirm, and I'm also pleased to announce that the next episode will feature Wiz Catches Lightning and the Rolling Historian. Be on the lookout in the coming weeks. There are only three kinds of flora and fungi in the depths, if you can believe it. The variations seen are simply different stages of maturity. The puff shrooms, bomb plants, and muddle buds can grow into massive sizes. So large, in fact, that the type of plant can be observed on the map. The puff shrimp. I heard you were talking about some plants. I love plants. Let's talk about plants. Depths are very, shall we say, interesting ecosystem. At a cursory glance, puff shrooms are the only tree like organisms which make any gosh darn sense in there. It's a giant cave, and these are fungi. They like damp, dark places, so they are feeling great right at home in there. Bomb plants and muddle ferns, though. Now these, these feel utterly out of place. Plants are most commonly known for their ability to photosynthesize. However, as we are all well aware, in order for that process to happen, light is required and tips... Well, it doesn't have any. Glow from unactivated light roots doesn't count, by the way. It isn't anywhere near strong enough to sustain any plants whatsoever, let alone ones of that size. This leads me to believe that muddle and bomb plants don't function like regular plants at all, instead relying on processes not unlike those employed by fungi to keep themselves alive and spread. Rather than using photosynthesis to create energy, these plants feed themselves by absorbing nutrients from their environment. 
Visible color of large bodies of these plants cements this idea even further. Since they don't use light to feed themselves, there is no reason for them to produce chlorophyll and have green leaves. Their color is instead determined by other factors, being either a random end result of the molecular makeup of the leaves or an attempt to avoid predation by local fauna. If muddle ferns are the main source of food for deep fireflies, for instance, it makes sense that they are purple. It is a color which is harder to distinguish from pitch black of the depths in the small bit of light a firefly produces. Alternatively, if either of the plants or the shrooms was targeted by, say, frogs, they might have developed some sort of a toxin to act as a deterrent. Color of the plant could have been influenced as a side effect. And that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Saying the environment of the depths is unique is an understatement. Conditions found within are unlike anything which can be found on the surface. Their impact on the growth found in the depths is profound, reaching far further than just the inability to photosynthesize. More than likely, all of these tree-like plants and fungi are both harder and more brittle than the surface trees. That's because on the surface, tall plants have to be able to withstand the destructive and ever-changing force of winds. Because of this, trees had to become somewhat flexible, allowing them to bend with the gales. In the depths, the conditions are vastly different. While air movement is indeed present in the chambers, it isn't anywhere near as strong or as varied as the winds encountered on the surface. This means that, in contrast to the surface trees, the growth in the depths didn't need to adjust to sometimes violent blows of wind in order to thrive, which in turn would allow the plants and fungi to become much more rigid instead, in order to support their own weight. As a quick side note, this is also why diamond swords are a terrible idea! Diamond is an extremely hard material, which also means that it is not flexible. Smash it enough times against something and it will shatter. Steel is still hard, but with a degree of wibbly wobbliness, which makes it a preferred material for swords. Okay, tangent over. To be honest, because of this presumed rigidness of growth in the depths, I am surprised the upheaval didn't wreak havoc within these caverns. Depths were a contained, long-stabilized environment. When the chasms opened, they suddenly allowed for a free exchange of massive volumes of air, creating strong winds in the process, lasting until the pressure stabilized again. This effect would of course decrease in strength proportionally to the distance away from the chasms, but within the closest proximity, the winds should have laid waste to the ferns and fungi. Which, if you remember my video about the Forgotten Temple, I suggested that there were massive caves below based on the presence of updrafts. After the upheaval, the updrafts are gone? Anyway. I wasn't done, you know? Sorry, back to plants. Now, where was I? Ah, right. The air currents. Or lack thereof. Usually. Under most circumstances. Ah, uh, you get what I mean. Plants possibly growing more hard and brittle than their surface counterparts is one thing. Them growing to absolutely humongous sizes is another. And let me tell you, this size of theirs also aided by no end conditions. On the surface, trees have a limit on the height they can reach. The higher they go, the stronger the winds become. But the trees can't turn more and more flexible to deal with that. They still need to retain some degree of toughness to not fall over under their own weight. It is a balancing act, and it has a limit. Not in no wind conditions, though! In the depths, main factors limiting the growth of plants are the availability of resources required for growth, competition for those resources, and predation. Which... Look at this place. Just look at it. There are like... 
two species of animals which could be feasting on these plants, so predation is bound to be low. Competition? What competition? Biodiversity of depths is incredibly low. These few species of plants and fungi essentially had all that real estate just for themselves. And that only leaves the nutrients, which we can only assume are plentiful because, well, again, look at these. These don't look like they are starving at all. Which leaves us with a question. Why? Why would gigantism, of all things, be the default. If the giant leaves of the Madun Fern don't act as massive solar panels, then what's the point in even growing them? That is a massive energy expense. That fern needed to exert a lot of effort to get this big. Poor thing. I do have an explanation, albeit heavily speculative. Which fits right in with the show, so let's go! Just before, I said that plants of this stature would require ready access to plentiful nutrients, preferably ones which can deliver a lot of energy when absorbed. And what is the one single element which is extremely common abso freaking lootly everywhere in the depths? That's right, it's zonite! And would you look at that, it is also well known for producing a lot of energy under the right conditions. That's very convenient, ain't it? What I'm saying is, it is highly probable that the growth in the depths evolved specifically to absorb mainly zonite, draw particles of it from the ground through huge, spanning networks of roots and mycelium, and catch zonite dust with their wide, massive leaves and shrooms. Gigantism for gigantism's sake makes no sense. However, if increasing the surface area to the extreme helps the plant gather valuable resources, well, then it is a reasonable adjustment. Or at least as reasonable as being this horrendously overgrown can be. And I can't help but notice that there sure are a lot of greenish particles floating around in the air of the depths. That dust is going to be settling really nice on large, flat surfaces such as these. Phew, well, that's all I have on the subject. Pretty neat, huh? Anyway, not gonna keep holding the video hostage anymore. You go on, and I'm gonna be heading back into my lair. Thanks for being patient with me. Ha! If you think about it, all three of these plants support combat and espionage. If you pay attention in depths, occasionally there are orchards that seem to be planted intentionally. This is evident because all of the plants within the area are at the same stage of maturity. There are also these petrified roots. They are smooth and cylindrical. They have an odd texture to them. Almost like eyes. Sometimes when I'm walking over them, it feels like I'm walking on mold. I'm not sure what else to call these other than petrified roots. They sprawl all over the depths. Charlie's leading theory was that perhaps they were part of a cave system from the surface. Every time he tried to match up these caves against the surface, it just simply didn't line up with the roots below. So then what are they? Have you considered they might not be roots at all? I'm hard pressed to find a trunk they'd be feeding into, and they're structurally weird anyway. Don't really split ever. They give me the creeps. Mayhaps they aren't natural, but man-made, and just created to look like roots. They could be cables. Everything we have left of Zanai is made either of green ceramic or smooth white rock. These things don't really match the texture of that rock, but if someone was trying to hide them, then perhaps that was intentional. No clue what they would be used for, though. Transporting Zonite mined by constructs to the surface? Maybe. I don't really know. Meh. Thanks, Max. Now I really gotta go, though. Make sure that you watch out on Drake and Wilde's channel in the coming weeks. I'm sure she will have brilliant analysis in whatever subject she chooses to cover. Was nice talking to you. Bye! It seems like they feed from these lakes of standing water. If you're a Dark Souls fan, you may recognize this motif. 
Charlie likes to call them, the roots of the earth tree. Flowing water is typically seen in many cultures as a sign of life. Think of the Nile, for instance. In a vast stretch of desert, there is an oasis of plants that can make food. It's luscious. Think of Pharaon region. This represents Furor, who gave life to everything. The only water that flows in the depths is from the wellsprings of power, courage, and wisdom. They feed up close to nearly every chasm. The chasms are covered with gloom. Charlie had an idea based off of this. He suggested that the gloom takes up all the space between Hyrule and the depths, which contributes to the isolation between the two environments. And in the depths, it's everywhere. It's all over this place. I feel like the gloom kind of acts like a bacteria or a fungus somehow. Typically, it sterilizes the area that it's in. In Japanese, gloom is known as miasma, a noxious form of bad air, formerly believed to cause diseases. In stark contrast, there is standing water. It is seen as an omen of disease and death. This obviously pairs well with the motifs of gloom. Some of these petrified root systems connect and grow up to the ceiling. These are conveniently nearby most chasms. In addition to these peculiar petrified protrusions, there are these very viney roots. They are twisted and usually are soaked in gloom, and even apply the gloom effect. Think of it like plants. They soak water to thrive. It seems that those light roots have soaked up the lights from the shrine above, and the gloom roots, they have absorbed the gloom to gain their power to grow. Comparing those two gives us evidence that those might be the same species. The light pulses through the light root, like blood does in a body, and so does the gloom pulse through the gloom roots. A look at the place where the end fight starts gives us a hint that the origin of those gloom roots lies beneath Hyrule Castle. Underneath the castle, there's a stone tablet that gives us more indication as to why the castle was built. Creating a champion refers to the castle as a sanctum. A sanctum is a sacred place, especially a shrine, within a temple or a church. Or, in this case, a castle. Hyrule Castle is just a massive shrine, and underneath this massive shrine is a massive light root, the Mother Light Root. And here we can find Ganon, or Dwarf, who has been sealed exactly there for a long time, and has produced a lot of gloom that could have corrupted the Mother Root which was close to him, and caused the small roots to extinguish, and with it he was able to bring back the darkness to the depths. There's not much information on what gloom is, but you can feel the effect everywhere throughout Hyrule. The people looking into the chasms are easily startled. Everyone in Hyrule seems to be facing their own crisis, especially at the beginning of the game. It doesn't have much of a physical effect on Hyrule, like the Malice did, but an effect on people's mental attitude. Everyone's down in the dumps, man. Think of it like a bad mood in the room. If you are in a room of people who are in a bad mood, people who are constantly picking on someone, people who don't like, or people that are constantly talking bad or sad stuff, your mood would change too. And gloom is like the manifestation of bad air. The Japanese word for gloom is shoki, which translated to miasma. Miasma, according to Cambridge Dictionary, is a very unpleasant general feeling or character of a situation or place, or an unpleasant fog that sometimes smells bad. Think of how Yeda was affected looking through the mirror of twilight. <coughs> Sorry, I mean the mirror of gloom. To quote Minda here, a mirror of gloom has the power to change people so much. Yes. You heard that correctly. The mirror was referred to as the Mirror of Gloom in Twilight Princess. This is also conveniently supported by the fact that Minna's helm gives gloom resistance. The kanji used to describe Minna's headpiece is a traditional cap worn by Shinto clergy and couriers. It is said to have been worn by the Queen of Shadows who fought for Hyrule alongside the Hero of Dusk. Gloom is mentioned many times throughout the Zelda series. Quote, do you remember what the spirit said about the fused stone of shadow? 
to those who tried to govern the sacred land with magic. Can you imagine what happened to them after all that? They were driven from Hyrule, the sacred land, by the gods, driven way to some other place. This place was another world, the antithesis to Hyrule, where the sun shines brightly. This region, which was unable to mingle with light, was known as Shadow. Thus, those cast into the world of Shadow were forbidden to return to their original world. It seemed that they would live within the eternal gloom as Hyrule's shadow. See, this is the history of my shadow clan passed down by us. Do you understand who I am? I'm a descendant of the clan that was cast into the world of shadow from the world of light. This leads me to believe that the depths is the dark world. All signs point to this, including what Zant says, that Ganondorf desires to unite the light world and the twilight realm. I mean, look at how many Poes there are. Which, by the way, where are the guardians? Where are the divine beasts? Do not tell me that they disappeared because they fulfilled their purpose. Because if I hear another person suggest that, I might just pop. There are barely any pieces left of them, and there's no way that they were all used to reconstruct the towers because that's really only using a small amount of the widely available Sheikah technology. There's only like 14 towers, when in Breath of the Wild there were towers, the pillars, the guardians, the divine beasts, and that's not even including the massive amount of shrines. So where did they all go? Maybe I'm just overthinking this. I was convinced it may be another timeline. The only thing that caused me to question this was the Guardian perched on top of Pyrrha's lab. Where are the Guardians? Where are the shrines, the divine beasts, the towers of ancient Sheikah origin? Yes, it is clear Pur and Robbie were dismantling all of this to repurpose that technology for better use. I would say it's even safe to say they saw this stuff as a liability, too dangerous to be kept lying around, just in case Calamity Ganon returned. If the Guardians and Divine Beasts were still around, that's a free army for the Calamity to take control of. And they don't know about the Demon King Ganondorf at this point, so it's safe to say they dismantled it to be safe and used what they could to design the new Skyview Towers. Guardian legs, elevator shafts from shrines, terminals from divine beasts and from shrines. But, as Mox points out, that doesn't account for everything. Even in Breath of the Wild, there were piles of discarded guardian bits outside of the tech lab's tolls of this research. Perhaps more interestingly, Ganondorf could be responsible. Let's keep in mind that he is a villain that learns from his defeats, from his mistakes, though never enough to stop trying. The Guardians and Divine Beasts were his personal army, but it was only a temporary victory. And the hero used the shrines and towers to gain information about his surroundings and also to regain his own strength after his 100-year slumber, bearing in mind that there are chasms that have sprung up filled with gloom in the exact spots where shrines used to be. It could be that Ganon himself decided to dispose of these shrines by dispatching gloom in specific key locations. It could be that in the same way that he shattered the Master Sword, which in theory would be much stronger than the walls of the shrines. It could be that he sent his gloom out to disintegrate, to devour all of these ancient Sheikah structures during the upheaval. So whatever Pur and Robbie hadn't gotten around to dismantling, whatever they couldn't have already repurposed, everything left in the ground still, gone, destroyed by gloom. I 
have a video on my own channel going a little more in depth about this subject that I would encourage you to check out, though this video might be uploaded before I get around to completing my own, so maybe just go and poke around the channel and see if it's up yet, and maybe subscribe if you want to make sure you see it when it does show up, but I think there is more to this mystery than what lies on the surface. I've always thought of the sky people as the engineers of advanced technology. They would send their wisdom down from the sky and those with connections to the sky people would deliver it for production. This is supported by the roles Link is given in both the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess being referred to as the messenger to the heavens. This messenger would deliver it to those who acted as mechanical and civil engineers such as the Sheikah. I was really confused about the timeline until I found all the armor sets while exploring the depths. The various armors include the Trousers of the Sky. Legend says these trousers were worn by a hero who appeared from the sky, riding a mighty bird. It was the original garb of a certain order of knights. The knights the item is referring to is the Knights Academy, where Link receives the set before looking for Zelda. The Trousers of Time. Legend says these trousers were once worn by a hero who traveled through time. They were originally made by a people who made their home in the forest. Tunic of the Hero. Legend has it, the armor was once cherished by a hero from ancient times. Its design is rather simple, but it's such a traditional look. The Tunic of Twilight. Legend has it that this armor was once worn by a hero who battled the monsters of Twilight. There still seems to be some hair clinging to it. Looks like it may have been from a wolf? Trousers of the Wind A hero who traveled across the ocean. The trousers are said to have been his favorite. A timeline merge could happen when Zelda gets cut out of her time without her permission. She's still the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia, after all, who is also the goddess of time. Now, without her presence, her timelines got confused and merged. The game gives us two proofs for this. The first one is when Ganondorf lifts up the castle. Here, we can't find any sky islands or sky debris falling. Only when Zelda gets called back in time by her stone, the sky debris starts to fall. The second proof we get from a cutscene. When Ganondorf steals the secret stone from Sonya, he shoots his gloom up into the sky. But it gets stopped by the sky barrier. Ganondorf's power should be great enough to break the normal sky barrier. That should be already a thing at this point. But Zelda, being now also in this time, strengthened the barrier with her presence so that even he couldn't get through. After the fight and sealing of Dorf, Zelda, with the knowledge of the future, reached out to the sages, gave them the order to work together and create everything the hero will need in the future. Then she went to Mineru, the last Zonai, and explained to her her plan. Mineru, now with Zelda's knowledge about the future and the Sheikah technology, was able to advance the structures and help the other sages out with blueprints. And so, all of them made their own Sky Islands. Zelda, being a part of the royal family, knew about the Sky Folk and the Sky Barrier, and that this was a place beyond the reach of demons. In the cutscene mentioned prior, she even saw it with her own eyes. She then informed Mineru that they had to hide the structures from evil and told her to lift everything into the sky as soon as they were done. Just like Hylia did. This was either done by the technology Zelda has provided, or Mineru has used the Zonai magic. At this point, not only did the timelines converge, she created a whole new split. Nintendo knows and acknowledges the timeline, but they are not a huge fan of it. So this game could be Nintendo's try to get rid of the timeline entirely. 
We can prove this by comparing the timelines with Tears of the Kingdom. They have managed to merge three different stories into one. You want some proof? No problem. Let's start with the downfall timeline. It starts off with Ganondorf being sealed, surrounded by sages, with the spirit of the hero missing. What happened in Tears of the Kingdom's past? Oh yeah, exactly that. Okay, let's take a look at the child timeline. It starts by Zelda using a time power. The current hero is guided by a former hero. Ganondorf gets killed by the hero with a stab in the chest. Again, just like in Tears of the Kingdom. Okay, the adult timeline. Here again, in the past, a hero is missing. Zelda joins Link in the fight against Ganondorf. And then he is killed with a stab in his forehead. Now compare all that to Tears of the Kingdom's last fight. There, Zeldra joins Link in the fight against Dragondorf. And Link kills him with... You wanna guess? That's right. A stab in his forehead. So this is how Nintendo tried and succeeded to combine three timelines into one. For them, this opens more possibilities in later story designs. Because they are now not tied to a specific line of events anymore. Now they can combine whatever they want and it still makes sense and please the player. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you for listening. Giving back to Mox. Benun heading out. Bye. Thanks, Benun. Consider the Age of Calamity references pointed out by Zelda Music Theory, which, as always, will be linked in the description below. Take a listen to this. Did you guys hear that? Listen to this again. Anyone remember that? That Age of Calamity motif appears this early. I think this one might be legitimate. There is clearly a narrative attempting to be conveyed here. Ah, timeline debates are back. I love it. In Ocarina of Time, Link is sent back in time at the end. He is sent back to the child timeline. When he goes to the castle to warn Princess Zelda, the Triforce of Courage appears on the back of Link's hand. The goddesses intervene to rebalance the Triforce. This also creates three different timelines. This clear and decisive choice causes timelines to split. Then, the time mechanics are established. If a choice alters the current reality, then the timeline splits, especially one involving the Triforce. We can argue semantics here for hours, but I have a simple proposition. A theory, if you will. It's an old one, not even my own. I haven't been able to track down the originator either. In Tears of the Kingdom, Demise never appeared. There is an argument that Dorf turned into an incarnation of Demise. However, Demise never did actually reappear, so I lost my bets fair and square. This would also mean that the timeline split happened as far back as Skyward Sword. Now, I know everyone's in an objective echo chamber, screaming it was a closed loop over and over again, but what if it isn't? After discussing these ideas with Benoon, she made this lovely graphic, which is pretty much my headcanon now. Humor me for a bit. What well, if these events in Skyward Sword cause a split at the beginning of the timeline? The events that took place in each are so drastic with heavy implications. Think about it. In one timeline, Demise is completely and utterly annihilated. The Skype Keep falls and seals Demise for good. Everyone in Skyward Sword is celebrating their accomplishments. All is peaceful, but Impa forgot to shut the door. Girahim takes Zelda back to a reality where Demise still lived. Given the conventions that would have been established involving time travel, I think it would be fair to conclude that Skyward Sword establishes 
more than one reality at the beginning of the timeline. One reality in which Demise was eradicated and another, his consciousness lives on within the Master Sword. The Sky Keep still fell, but Demise continues to live on. Skyward Sword happens before Hyrule is established. Now, consider the fact that here, in this reality, the Bargainer was sealed. It doesn't necessarily say how he was sealed. Majora's Mask Clock Town would have been the flourishing center celebrating this every year when Demise was eradicated. Quote, For ages, people have worn masks resembling the giants who are the gods of the four worlds. Hmm. Seems familiar. Masks, you say. The pieces start to fit together when considering it from this angle. Majora's Mask, the item, is canon. It's not just an amiibo drop. This is a reward for completing the Colosseum full of Lynels in the depths, handed down from ancient times. This proves that the world that we are currently in is connected to, or is, Termina. And the boss chamber within the ancient city of Garandia has this giant unmistakable depiction of the yellow sun on the ceiling and the depiction of the red sun on the floor, the same as the inverted stone tower temple. This flooded me with a lot of thoughts and perspectives to consider. For instance, the tree Link fell down in the Lost Woods. Was it the depths? No, it can't be. There was a sky. There were people there, right? But then there's Gloom. Was Link under the effects of Gloom? What is Termina? Let's take a walk down memory lane, shall we? The first place Link really encounters in Termina is the clock tower. Broken gears lay all over the floor. There is an impending doom overhead. The characters are all nearly the same. This is even where Tingle himself is first introduced. The same people must be saved over and over again. The same monster forces must be defeated, though. Minor characters don't remember who Link is. Characters like Hetsu and Bolson. The mechanics of the moon enters the kingdom and those in Majora's Mask are not the same, but it definitely evokes the same feelings. If you watch the blood moon in the game, it actually shrinks back down to normal size, almost like the moon is getting closer and sucking all the demons up from the ground. It's weird to think about. Charlie says, think high tide, but with monsters. The wooden shield has this design. This same design appears in the moon in the boss room chamber in Majora's Mask. The Gleok Den is an example of this narrative of the four giants, protectors of the region. It is not only Majora's Mask, though. There are items from every single timeline. They are all canon. So what if, like, all the same exact events happen as in the canon timeline, just a little differently? I have this record player playing in my head like a mantra over and over again. One to summon the sun and another to summon the moon. The parallels between Hylia and Demise are so blatant. Even these giant sky spheres have depictions of the sun and the moon on the inside. The themes are blatant and simple. This is a fight between light and darkness. But then when examining darkness, it gets tricky to say the least. Those who have played Breath of the Wild recognize this little devil. Hearts can be traded for stamina at a 20 rupee cost, and vice versa. This was how I was able to complete both story sections, only because 10 hearts and 2 stamina wheels were required to beat the story. So I had to do a few shrines. There are not many answers when it comes to this story. Jaren says, quote, the horn statue is an entity who deals in life and power. 
As there is a goddess of light, then it follows that she would have an opposite, the horn statue, which would make the dais the place where it was enshrined back when it was still a god. Like light and dark, one cannot exist without the other. Their power manifests through each other's existence. This line in the English localization came off extremely Japanese to me. So, to the translations we go. I had Lou Rolling Historian, Quest with Aaron, and a translator I hired from Fiverr provide translations for this line. Benum provided her handiwork breaking down the individual meanings of each kanji. In addition, I puzzled over all this information as a whole in order to derive meaning for your entertainment. And it is way more complicated than it seems. Okay, okay, so this group of, of kanji right here, this is like in quotations, right? So she's quoting something, okay? So this is Quest with Aaron's translation of it. The god who governs life and power incur the wrath of the goddess and fall into darkness. This kanji, I asked him why he'd say darkness, uh, and he said he'd probably change out the word darkness for something demonic related, depending on the context. And then the Rolian translates it as the god of life and power incurs the wrath of the goddess and succumbs to evil. This, this kanji right here is ma. Because of the nuance of the kanji, ma has a lot of different meanings. It's a Buddhist term, Mara, meaning demon, devil, demon, evil spirit, harmful or evil thing or person, magic, the unnatural, crazy, delusional, manic, to be obsessed with, and idolatry. So yeah, a lot. According to Aaron, it's the same kanji that appears in Ma Jin. Lorillian pointed out that it's the same dark energy that describes Vadi. This energy also describes a powerful deity from Majora's Mask, which is actually Majora's Majin. Majin being the key here. So that brings us to the Bargainer. Bargainer has seven statues, each of them with their own unique situations. The bargainer within the great central mine appears to be enshrined. In fact, the structure was built around this oddly shaped boy. The bargainer has three fingers and his feet come to a point. The body protrudes in a rather weird, bulging, armored looking exterior. Nothing like our human brains find aesthetically pleasing. The bargainer has a neckline where his hood meets his torso. He has four eyes and a blank expression. Charlie sussed it out. He felt like the bargainer was being two-faced because, well, he actually has two faces. They peer below all the springs with the statue of Hylia. These are also the only place where flowing water appears in the depths at the wellsprings of power, courage, and wisdom. The bargainer at the spring of wisdom shows more of its back. It looks like he has a gigantic face there that looks rather evil. The face has a huge nose, big bumpy eyes, and his mouth has fangs. The one under the mother goddess statue, the cliffside bargainer, is the most odd case. When approaching him from the cliff, the face is shown in all its glory. I can't help but feel Majora's Mask vibes. It's kind of meant to evoke these feelings. These bargainers make more sense when looking at the Japanese name for them. In Japanese, these bargainers are known as Majin Zao, which means demon statue. These bargainers are demons. All of these bargainers appear almost directly below the statues of Hylia. What has me shook is that there's an eighth hidden bargainer. Mount Hylia's silhouette on the map is the exact shape of the bargainer. Majin Zhao isn't only a reference to a demon, 
but a magician or a witch. Hey, Wiz here. So, the kami are cool because they were like explanations for natural events. In ancient Japan, a kid would ask, Father, why does it thunder? And his father's response would be something like, Well, you see, the thunder god Suzano must be causing another mess in the heavens. Like all people who practiced oral tradition, the Japanese used myths as vehicles to explain the inexplicable. Much like people who theorize about Zelda lore, they saw something mysterious and found a way to ascribe meaning to that mystery. Now, the horned statue. It somehow moves from Hateno all the way over to the Hyrule Royal Passage, specifically right next to where a lot of people are stationed, the subterranean area of Lookout Landing. The people here have something to gain from this statue, as they are constantly fighting off the demons that plague Hyrule, and they stand something to gain from the horned statue. The horned statue even makes mention of moving from its previous location in Hateno Village to the underground passage near Lookout Landing. What correlates with this migration? The residents of Zelda in Hateno Village. I have no idea what any of this means, but I do find it interesting. But like Mox said, Hylia's morality has both positive and negative aspects. I mean, we have these Hylia statues that are fairly vanilla positive. And then we have this horned statue that looks like Hylia's polar opposite, and it even has some personality to boot. The horned statue isn't like, ah, you did this noble deed, please receive my blessing, I'm gonna go heal a kid with self-image issues now. Instead, the horned statue says something like, yeah, I was making life for money bargains, I got caught by the goddess, and uh, well, are you in? Come on, man, I was trapped in a pond for centuries with only fish for company. Do you know anything about fish? They make terrible deals. I couldn't help but chuckle when I read that dialogue from the statue. The horned statue definitely alludes to some sort of dynamic I can't quite wrap my head around. Perhaps the Kami Mami Hylia took all the unfavorable parts of herself and sealed it within this statue. That's why this deity is able to exchange heart containers and stamina vessels. And it's difficult to not see a parallel with these bargainer statues in the depths. One thing's for certain, there's definitely something fishy going on here. Looking into some of the Japanese lore reveals more answers. The creative gods of ancient Japan were Izanagi and Izanami. They were lovers, and their mutual love gave birth to the archipelago of Japan. After some time, however, Izanami died during childbirth with the advent of Kagatsuchi, the god of fire. Izanagi placed Izanami's body inside of a cave, and after, well, he wept. Izanagi wept so hard that his literal tears gave birth to gods, or as the people of ancient Japan called them, Kami, the creative and natural cosmic entities of ancient Japan. Specifically, the tear of his left eye gave birth to Amaterasu, the sun goddess. Think about the Shika eye symbol here. Izanagi's right eye gave birth to Tsukuyomi, the moon god, and his nose gave birth to Suzuno, the indomitable god of storms and lightning. Amaterasu, according to the research I first gleaned from my friend Gamesmiths, was the goddess of the sun. The sun passes over the sky, and this denotes a passage of time. The sun also has a history of being symbolic of light and truth, as it is the ultimate source of light, and it is able to cast away darkness, which has a habit of obscuring things. This translates to Hylia being a goddess of both light and time. However, as we see in Tears of the Kingdom, she was more so the goddess of time. Queen Sonia mentions that while Zelda has both the essences of light and time, her potency of time is more present. Look at ancient Impa from Skyward Sword for reference. She's a Sheikah, the tribe that is said to serve the gods, and she's literally dressed like a sundial, a device that was capable of measuring time by casting a shadow from the light of the sun. Izanagi, at some point, went to go check on the corpse of his former lover. What he found was horrifying. He found her corpse rotting and giving birth to the literal dark world, what the Japanese called Yomi, the underworld. You see, because Izanami had eaten the fruit of the land of Yomi, she became bound to its properties. And when she tried to re-enter the world of light, Izanagi saw her undead form, and he was repudiated by it. He would not allow the return of his former lover, and Izanami rebuked him for this. In fact, she generated hatred and resentment for it, but something also spawned from the goddess. 
a cosmic entity came into form that isn't spoken about all that much in Japanese folklore. A primeval energy that had always been around. It only took form when it had the body of a god to utilize as a vessel. And that entity was Amatsu Mikaboshi, or as we call him, Mikaboshi. He's known as the literal embodiment of hatred and resentment. So how exactly does Mikaboshi play into all of this? Demise is kind of a mixture of Mikaboshi and Suzuno, with a little bit of Tsukiyomi mixed in for fun. Did somebody say Blood Moon? Demise has this curious scar on his forehead from when his horn was removed and the ceiling spike was inserted into said forehead by Hylia at the climax of their battle. It looks like a star. In fact, it looks like a Dread Star. The title of what Mikaboshi is, the Dread Star. We could characterize Demise as the embodiment of rancor, hatred, resentment, Demise is everything Amaterasu isn't. He's a shadow of Izanami, born from Izanami's hatred. He's also the raw incarnation of emotions that, if left unchecked, can lead to physical, emotional, and social destruction. Mikaboshi's goal is the destruction of everything, as well as the regression of creation back to chaos. Mikaboshi is, at times, described as a formless black smoke. He's depicted as gray-haired with fiery red eyes, long claws, and sharp teeth. Heck. Sometimes he's even characterized as oil, like this goop we see here at the Water Temple in Tears of the Kingdom. But Demise didn't come back! Save it for the birds. The Demon King came back. When Ganondorf kills Sonya, he acquires her secret stone. Now, secret stones are said to be neutral. Their power, however, lies in the quality of being able to bring out the essence most present in the individual who possesses each secret stone. And you know what Ganondorf, the avatar of Demise's curse, has a whole stockpile of? He has an essence of resentment and hatred. This time, it's hatred and resentment for a people who were perceived as gods by the Hyruleans, and who lowered their seemingly divine status to be among them, the Zonai. Hatred and resentment for the gods. Now, where have I heard that before? We see the kanji for Rancor appear above Ganondorf's head before transforming into the Demon King. Ganondorf's eyes change from the traditional topaz hue into a crimson and fiery red. Symbolically speaking here, he conquers time when he usurps the Time Secret Stone from Sonya, neutralizes it, and then transforms its power to bring out his hatred. And what's Demise's title? He's known as the Conqueror of Time. I'll cover more on this in future videos over on my channel, so be sure to keep an eye out for those. So, I have a bit of a theory. Shadow and light are two sides of the same thing. Neither of them would be possible without the other. To tell the truth, each of us was studying a different song. One to summon the sun, and another to summon the moon. So, that brings us back to the matter of... The Bargainer. This is the first time that we meet the Bargainer, but I don't think this is the first time that we've seen the Bargainer. The only way that the Bargainer can return Pose to the afterlife is by asking Link for his assistance. This DD proudly displays both faces in his father Bargainer statue on the cliffside. These are labeled as demon statues, but let's consider this from another angle, shall we? Oh, you. Please. And that brings us to the goddess statue. Please. Praying to the goddess statue at the spring of power, courage, and wisdom reveals a quest. Devout swordsman who offers his prayers, hear my plea. I can no longer sense the presence of the Mother Goddess statue which dwells in the vast canyon. I would ask you to go to that land and bring tidings to me of the Mother Goddess statue. Please. Please. Tinagar Canyon was tied to the royal family so heavily during development that it was called the Valley of the Royal Family. Within this valley is the Forgotten Temple. This is also where the secret stones are kept. If you look at this location in the depths, everything clicks. The valley looks like a dragon. 
If Link goes to the oldest and largest goddess statue, then he will see she has been toppled. My name is Leneru. Because of you, we spirits of light have been able to revive here in Hyrule once more. O oh, divinely chosen hero, you seek a black power. Our world is one of balance. Just as there is light to drive away darkness, so too is there benevolence to banish evil. It sleeps within the temple at the bottom of Lake Hylia. Hylia herself would abandon her divine body, and her soul would be reincarnated as a human. However, you mustn't ever forget this. It was by the order of the gods that was sealed away, that forbidden power. When the world was naught but chaos, the gods descended and established life and order. And then, after bestowing power equally to everyone, they returned to the heavens. The ground where the gods first ascended came to be known as a sacred land. The world knew peace for a very long time because of the hearts of the faithful. I am far below this land, talking to you by borrowing the form of this statue. However, eventually a rivalry occurred in Hyrule, the sacred land. Hylia decided to use the inheritance of the ancient gods to annihilate the destroyer. I am the one whose four eyes were taken from me and sealed away long ago. The Bargainer, Hylia, the Forgotten Temple, the Secret Stones. Amidst the people, there appeared those who excelled at sorcery. They tried to govern the sacred land with their powerful magic. It's said that they were born from a union with the gods' clan. How were these secret stones made? We must stop the destroyer from getting out of the seal, no matter what it takes. However, the gods dispatched us spirits of light. We managed to seal away their enormous magic. And it's that magic, that black power, that is the fused stone of shadow. O oh, divinely chosen hero, please take care. You should know that those possessing such a dangerous power will, before long, be ruled by it. You mustn't forget that. All seems so convoluted until... Until I saw Zelda is a light dragon that creates tears, and the secret stones are kept here. Why are they referred to as secret? The secret stones amplify the abilities of their wielder. I speculate that these stones were made by the stolen eyes of the bargainer. Not one of the three goddesses, but the only god, the Kami-sama, the one god among the three goddesses. The vessels of his spirit cried these powerful stones, these Magatama. They are all blank stones until the person touches it. It amplifies each person's Tamashi. Good, evil, that's the futile perspective of narrow-minded beings. This is why Ganondorf is able to wield one and become the Demon King. What is even more strange is that when the sages in each region get their secret stone, they get this incredible power to project their auras. Just like what is depicted in Lineru's warning to Link. Ganondorf is able to project his aura, and we call these Phantom Ganons. These also look like the vows the sages give. The magic staff was made by an ancient magician who awoke the latent power of gems. 
The stones amplify the power of the bearer, right? Offer pose to me. This deity is introduced to allow us to speculate on the meaning. Take all these details in. These will fuel our analysis and theories. If we're speculating on the backstory of the bargainer's eyes, we can imagine a tale of ancient power and betrayal. Long ago, the bargainer was a revered guardian of an ancient civilization or sacred place, entrusted with guiding Poe's to the afterlife. His eyes were said to possess immense magical properties. However, a group of individuals, driven by greed and thirst for power, sought to harness the energy within the eyes for their own dark purposes. They devised a cunning plan to steal the eyes from the bargainer. Through a treacherous act of deception or ambush, these thieves managed to incapacitate the bargainer, extracting the eyes that housed the secret stones. This act of betrayal left the bargainer weakened, vulnerable, and sealed away, while the thieves reveled in their newfound source of power, extracting the secret stones from the eyes of the bargainer. This perhaps could be why the Sheikah adopted the depiction of the crest, because the Sheikah were the ones to perform this betrayal on the bargainer. The secret stones, shaped like tears, were carefully extracted from the bargainer's eyes, causing immense pain and suffering to the guardian. The thieves, with the stolen eyes in their possession, set out to exploit the magical properties to use against the Demon King. Meanwhile, the bargainer, stripped of their eyes and the secret stones, was sealed away in the depths. A hidden realm where their voice echoed in desperation. I believe Hylia sacrificed her divine form to acquire the eyes, make the secret stones, and reincarnate to be able to use that power. Her plan was to reincarnate, right? Taking the eyes from the person who literally returned souls to the afterlife would ensure that she could do that over and over again. It would allow her to devise a plan. She did this all to protect the people, and not thinking about how it could have serious consequences. I also believe that this is how Demise came to be. Demise's anger and resentment may not have been unwarranted. He has a gash on his forehead. Demise may be the wrath after the war between them over his eyes. These tears give the ones who wield them the power to literally project their aura. A dark power in the wrong hands. The Demon King will absorb the spirit of the Goddess. O oh, youth, guided by the servant of the Goddess. That forbidden power. Unite earth and sky and bring light to the land. You mustn't ever forget this. Please. Look, I know these ideas are crackpot, but it's on brand. Who really knows everything that's going on anyway? Like, <laughs> there are so many ideas being thrown around. And I don't even think any of us really knows what's going on. We can definitely figure it out together, though. Mull it over in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. I'm throwing a lot of speculation on the board, but that's just to see what sticks. You know? Trying to make sense of this enormous mystery. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and thank you for your ongoing enormous support. Remember to subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.